Let me begin by telling you what I'm going to try to tell you. Um, some of it is already available online uh, and will appear in publications. And, um, I did philosophy of mind a long time ago, uh, and then went into various aspects of biology. Um, I wrote a paper called Answering, you can see it up here, it's the title of my talk, called Answering Descartes Beyond Turing. And it's online, if you Google it. It will be published in the centennial volume for Alan Turing, the once and future Turing. Um, that's one of the chapters. I'm very pleased about that and honored. Uh, the book's a bit late. It should have come out months ago. It should be out within a few months. Um, the editors keep telling me. So it will appear. But you can find it by Googling it. Part of what I'm going to talk about is in the article. Uh, the first is an attempt to answer Descartes. I think I have a way, possibly, of answering Descartes' problem that has had us stuck for years. To do so, I'm going to be bringing in quantum mechanics. I'm inspired by Penrose, but take a different path. The second thing I'm going to do is something I've not talked about in public, except um, by Skype to a conference in the Galapagos. Just maybe, just maybe, I have ideas for a responsible free will. Since I think we have no ideas for a responsible free will, um, any idea may be better than nothing, and I, I hope I can present it to you. The third is the following. Um, I think the ideas that I'm going to tell you may lead to a totally new kind of something like an information processing system that's partially quantum, partially classical or classical for all practical purposes, and something in between that my colleagues and I have discovered called the poison realm that goes back and forth between being quantum and classical. So we may be able to get beyond Turing and the Turing machine and make something entirely new. And I think it may have something to do with how the brain works. So that's what I'm going to try to talk about. And um, I, I'm sitting down because I've been asked if I could be recorded, and apparently one needs my voice to be heard. So I hope you understand why I'm sitting down. So, um, OK. I'm going to read, but you can look up here. And I often don't use slides at all. I, I think I'm getting old I'm starting to use slides. I'm going to begin with Descartes. We all know Descartes. He starts modern science. We all know Descartes' Res Cogitan and Res Extensa. Res Cogitan was to be mind stuff. Um, thinking, sensation, and all of that. And what he thought of these little events that is called the subjective ball. Res Extensa was a mechanical worldview um, that was the foundation of what became classical physics. I'm going to get in a minute, I and mean, so Descartes gives us a dualism, race, cogitan, race, extensa, so we all know that. And we're going to, we all know that it has never worked. And I, I want to try to show you my view of why it has never worked, then try to find an answer to Descartes and why it has never worked. And the issue comes up with Newton. So we all know Newton, but let's go over what Newton taught us. We are all still children of Newton. Um, Newton invented differential and integral calculus. Three laws of motion, universal gravitation. Then, if I may take the example of a billiard table with billiard balls on it, and the balls are rolling around. If we were to say, uh, uh, Isaac, is we're on first name basis, What's going to happen to the balls? He would say, don't be stupid. I told you what to do. Measure the current positions and momenta, uh, mass times velocity, of each of the balls. Those are the initial conditions. Measure the shape of the table off which the balls bounce. Those are the boundary conditions. <laughs> Given the initial conditions and the boundary conditions, 
write my equations in differential equation form, which gives the forces between the balls. What he had done is to mathematize Aristotle's efficient cause. Um, then he says, integrate my equations to get the future trajectories of the balls for all time, ignoring friction. Uh, we can put in friction later. But what's integration? It is to deduce the consequences of the differential equations for the motions of the balls on the table. But deduction is logical entailment. All men are mortals. Socrates is immortal. Therefore, Socrates, uh, I mean, sorry, all men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is immortal. <coughs> the two premises entail the conclusion. In exactly the same way, Newton's differential equations via integrations entail the motion of the balls for all time. So Newton gave us, at the birth of classical physics, the view of the becoming of the physical world as entirely entailed. Now with Laplace, uh, Laplace then says, if a demon in the sky knew the positions and momenta of all the particles in the universe, using Newton's laws, the demon, Laplace's demon, could deduce the entailed future and past, because Newton's laws are time reversible, of the entire universe. And that is the birth of reductive materialism. Reductive because there's a law somewhere that entails everything that will happen, and materialism because Newton's laws have, uh, have taken Aristotle's efficient cause of the forces between the walls. So this is the birth of modern reductive materialism. Given that, We've had a central problem in the philosophy of mind since Newton, already known to Descartes and his detractors, and we all know it, but let's say it and look at it. Suppose that the, we're worried about, say, the mind-brain system or the mind-body system. Let's say mind-brain to be kind of simple. Suppose that the brain is a perfectly deterministic dynamical system like the billiard balls. Add deterministic noise later if you want. It will change nothing. Then the current state of the brain, like the current state of the billiard balls, is entirely sufficient <coughs> to determine and entail the next state of the brain, just like the billiard balls. Then, as we all know, there is nothing whatsoever for mind to do. Furthermore, there is no way for a mind to do it. What's the mind supposed to do? Make the billiard balls move in a different way. The philosophy of mind, in my view, has been frozen here since Descartes and Newton. We have not had an answer. We've had idealism with, with Berkeley, and we have all kinds of other things. We haven't ever solved this problem. And I know all of you, or many of you in this room, are deeply, deeply I'm going to try to provide a completely different answer. You may not like it, but um, because it's, uh, I, I shouldn't have said that. Just please hear it and see what you think. Okay? So, we've got the, the following problems that then comes to us. If, if that view which, that I just told you is true and it's been held for years, then mind is either an epiphenomenon or an illusion, or we don't know what to say and we're kind of stuck with that. Um, I want to say um, that w what's the failure in classical physics? The failure that derives from classical physics is the notion that for there to be a consequence, it must be a causal consequence, like a billiard ball hitting a billiard ball. And if that's true, then of course there's nothing for a mind to do, because its mind would have to be an additional cause, and we don't know how to do that. We don't see how raised cogitan can be a cause in something like Newtonian sense. So I want to say we're never going to answer Descartes with classical physics, period.
I don't think we do. But I think there is a potential answer, and it lies in quantum mechanics. Um, Vincent said, my God, I wanted to avoid quantum mechanics. Um, Vincent, I'm sorry. I, I hope we can become friends anyway. I'm inspired by Penrose um, and give him full credit for being the first to push us in this direction. So I'm going to tell you about quantum mechanics because you may not all know it. Uh, I'm a biologist, doctor, and my knowledge of quantum mechanics is a philosopher, biologist, knowledge of quantum mechanics. But let me tell you about it. Um, you all know, um, so I'm going to start, I'm going to start with the famous two-slit experiment. And I need to move reasonably rapidly. If you don't know this material, uh, if you haven't run into the fundamentals of quantum mechanics, be prepared to be uh, utterly surprised. So, this, this is from the famous finding of uh, the famous physicist Richard, oh, thank you very much. Would you do that for me, please? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. It's a, it's a, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I owe you a cappuccino. Uh, okay. So, um, so Richard Feynman, uh, the famous physicist, in his three-volume series on, on the foundations of physics, says, the fundamental problems of quantum mechanics are already in the two-slit experiment. So I'm quoting Feynman roughly now. He says, imagine that you have a metal plate, a thick metal plate, with two holes in it, and behind it, kind of slanted, is a sandbox. Take a gun and fire bullets. In experiment one, let there be two holes in the metal plate, like the two slits, if you make two slits that are holes in the metal plate. Cover one of the holes with another metal plate, so only one is open. Fire bullets that go through the second, call it the right hole. And what do you expect to find in the sand after you fired a thousand bullets? Well, a pile of bullets in the sand you find behind the right hand hole. Now, exchange uh, and cover the right hand hole and fire the bullets. And what do you expect to find in the sand? A pile of bullets behind the left hand. Yes? That's the behavior of perfectly classical physical particles. I'm, I'm quoting from it. Okay. Now he says, do the same thing with light. So take a photon gun, like a flashlight, where you can tune how often a photon comes out. And of course they travel at the speed of light. Change this whole thing from this heavy wall to just a screen with two slits cut in it and a photo detector behind it, like an old-fashioned film emulsion from when many of us were younger, like a just silver daylight uh, surface. Uh, now, cover the left slit with uh, a piece of wood and fire the flashlight, or one photon an hour through towards the right slit or towards the screen and then wait and develop the film. And what you get is a bright spot behind the right slit, just like the pile of bullets. A lot of photons that hit behind the right slit. Everybody understand me? Now exchange and put the uh, wooden plate over the right slit so the left slit is open. Fire the photons rapidly with a flashlight, or one per hour, and wait. And what you get is a bright spot after you develop the film <coughs> behind the open vessel. So far, everything is what you'd expect from classical physics. Then the physicists, being smart, said, what if we open both slits? And here is the amazing result. You don't, you'd expect you get a bright spot behind the two open slits. That's not what you get at all. What you get is a light band and a dark band and a light band dark band and a light band and a dark band and a light band and a dark band called an interference pattern. Who's the one you just keep up? Thank you so much for being here. It's called an interference pattern. There is no way to explain that behavior in classical physics. And the stunned physicists in the 
from 1901 was blocked to 1927, and a little bit after it was destroyed, I said, my God, how can we explain this? And they invented quantum mechanics. So, next I need to tell you that quantum mechanics is formulated in the Schrodinger equation, which is a linear, that's an important point, wave equation, kind of like a water wave equation, which has waves propagating through space and time. Uh, it's linear, and linear means that if you have two waves, the sums and differences of those waves are also solutions, and that's the famous phenomenon of superposition and that comes up in quantum mechanics and in the vibrating string. Let me give you a water analogy if you're going to need to understand where I'm going. Again, I, I guess Feynman says this, but it, it's easy to understand. Imagine we're down at the beach and there's a seawall and water waves are coming in towards the beach. They're just plain waves. They're just parallel to the beach, and their space is 10 meters apart from peak to peak, have a seawall made out of stone, and cut two big slots in the seawall, say a meter wide each. And the beach is, say, 20 meters, or 30 meters, or 40 meters beyond the seawall. What's going to happen? Well, have both of these slots open. When a, a wave passes through one of the slots, on the beach side, you'll get a semicircular set of waves that propagate towards the beach, right? Can everybody get that? But you'll get a semicircular set of waves propagating towards the beach from the left slit in the seawall, and a semicircular set of waves propagating from the right slot some little distance away, okay? These two semicircular patterns, after they propagated their waves, have waves that overlap one another. Do the two semicircles do this? Yes? Far enough from the, far enough from the two slots. So, now we're going to get to the interference pattern. Imagine that you're standing at a point on the beach, a single point, and a wave can propagate to you from the left slit, and a wave can propagate to you from the right slit. It may be the case that where you're standing on the beach, the top or crest of one wave and the crest of another wave arrive at the same time and hit your foot. What will you get? You'll get a higher wave. That's going to correspond to a bright spot in the Schrodinger equation where the crests of two waves arrive. Or you could be standing at another spot where the bottom or trough of one wave and the trough of another wave and that's going to correspond, so you're going to get a deeper trough. That's going to correspond to a bright spot in quantum mechanics. The magic is, is that in between the two, there's a spot where the peak of one wave hits your foot, that the trough of another wave hits simultaneously, and the two cancel out. They cancel out, so there's no wave at all. And that's going to correspond to a dark spot on the screen. That's why the wave equation can explain the interference pattern. I just told you the central idea. Okay? So, that's it. Now I want to go back to something I already told you. If you fire one photon an hour and accumulate the spots, each one will give rise to a spot somewhere on the screen. That spot on the screen that arises is called a measurement got a spot on the screen, on the filming motion. The spot lasts for months when you develop the film. I'm going to come back to it. This is called not only a quantum measurement event, it's a dissipative measurement event. And it's terribly important that the spot is a stable structure that lasts for a long time. This is going to be the basis for my argument about an ontological <coughs> free will. I'm going to make a new use of quantum mechanics. Uh, I hope I'm right. Okay, anyway, the important point right now is that if you fire a photon an hour, you still get the interference pattern. Therefore, this wave property is true of each single photon. Got it? It's not a property of a set of photons. Each photon is behaving as this weird wave. I'm going to pause for a philosophic point that I really don't have time for, but it's fascinating. 
Feynman developed a theory of quantum mechanics called the sum over all possible histories and says each photon is simultaneously taking all possible paths through the two slits to the film emulsion. That means that Feynman has to say of the photon, this isn't in my talk, but it's terribly important, the photon simultaneously does and does not go through the left slit. That statement violates Aristotle's law of the excluded middle. The cat is on the table, or the cat is not on the table. There's nothing in between. This is a very important quantum coherent behavior. Violates Aristotle's law of the excluded middle. That's why we cannot picture it. I, I have a lot I can say about it, uh, and I, we, maybe in the discussion section we can come back to that. But notice that once there's a spot on the screen, the spot is either there or not there. It no longer violates Aristotle's law of the excluded middle. So the quantum measurement event has the weird property that it takes something that violates Aristotle's law of the excluded middle, and the result is something that no longer violates Aristotle's law of the excluded middle. I'm going to call the first a possible, and we'll come back to that later. Um, and I'm going to call the second. I'm going to call, I'm not going to use this, but good. Violating Aristotle's law of the excluded middle, being a possible, and something that is a screen and is now consistent with the law of the excluded middle, an actual. That's a whole long thing. That's all I'm going to say. All the same one there. Okay, now. Now, let's go back to the water wave. Um, in quantum mechanics, the equivalent so if you wrote an equation for the propagating water wave, um, each point in the propagating water wave would know, uh, think of the, of the waves as having a period and an amplitude, okay? Call that the phase and the amplitude of the water wave. Each point in the wave equation for water knows the phase and the amplitude at that point. That doesn't mean that somebody knows it, it's in the equation. The equivalent in quantum mechanics is something called phase information. And it's a thing that oscillates in time and space. And the phase information is keeping track in the Schrodinger equation for the height and amplitude of each wave at each point in space and time. OK? Now, I'm going to tell you something that has been discovered in the last 20 years. In a closed quantum system, where no phase information can escape, the system always stays coherent unless there's a measurement event. In the last 20 years, Wojtek Zurich, a, a dear friend of mine in San Jose, and others have been developing something called open quantum systems, where you have a quantum system, but it's part of a larger environment like the rest of the universe. And the open quantum system can lose phase information to the rest of the universe. There's two points to be made about it. The loss of phase information to the rest of the universe is entirely a causal. There's no cause. It just happens. Phase information is lost. It's not like billiard balls hit in billiard balls. This phase information just disappears. It's a causal. It's going to be critical to my argument. The consequence of this is the following. The peaks and the valleys of the waves no longer know where they are. Therefore, you can no longer get interference patterns because the peaks and the valleys don't know where they are. It's a kind of gradual process, and it's called decoherence. And it's absolutely established experimentally. What happens is, over time, the interference pattern fades. And it is said by the physicists that you approach classicality infinitely closely as time goes on. And it's called classicality for all practical purposes, FADB. The physicists do not know where the classical world comes from. They don't. Okay? One approach to it is called the Dino Harris program. I'm going to use it as one of two answers to Descartes. Um, to do so, I'm going to, well, let's just take a start. 
Uh, the start of the following. Suppose somehow, I'm going to get more precise in a little bit, the mind, the mind brain system is both quantum and classical. The brain, say, is classical in some sense, and the mind is somehow quantum. I'm going to go fast and come back to slower. Suppose that the quantum system, imagine that being coherent in quantum is pink, and as it decoheres in a region, it becomes ever more gray. So just picture a sheet that's pink, and then little gray regions appear. Well, what's happening is that in the gray regions, without any cause at all, the quantum system now has consequences for the classical system. After all, a spot still appears in the presence of decoherence. You just don't get the interference pattern. Okay? That means that, and here's the critical idea, one, to answer Descartes, mind can have a causal consequences for brain that never acts on brain classically. So we've avoided the problem that's plagued us since Descartes. There's no cause going on at all. It's a cause. And I thought this was some years ago. That's great. I thought I started answering Descartes. But that's no good. It will only happen once. You get deep appearance. I thought, and I just invented this whole, I just invented it in 19, I thought I got to have recoherence somehow so the brain can do it more than once. That was the start in 1995 of something that's become a discovery with Galvar Batali at the Bush University in South America. We believe that we've discovered what may be a new state of matter that we call the poison breath. And I'm just going to sketch it. Almost certainly it's true. Um, uh, it consists in two axes. The y-axis is uh, the degree of coherence. So as you go up the y-axis, you lose coherence. From coherent behavior to ever more decoherent. The x-axis is order, criticality, and chaos, which in the classical world you can get by tuning Hamiltonians. And you get what's called the second order phase transition and criticality. Uh, and in the quantum world, the x axis criticality is the metal insulated transition um, where you get go from extended to non extended wave functions. So, all of that's kind of numb. What's new is the idea of recoherence. There's a theorem due to the mathematician Peter Shore that if you have a quantum computer and the qubits are decohering and you inject information, you can make the qubits recohere. And it's a theorem. Um, and it's been used by those who are doing quantum computation to try to do quantum error correction with qubits. So it's this whole big industry out there in quantum computer math. So in principle, recoherence is possible. There may be experimental evidence for it as well. I'm not quite certain of it. If so, the poised realm that Gabor, Vata, uh, Samuli, and I have come up with is this two-dimensional space in which a system goes from being quantum to being classical or classical for all practical purposes, legal errors back to being quantum, and goes back and forth and, and moves around in this space. I will just tell you that we've done work showing that different organic molecules are at different locations on the x-axis. Some are ordered, some are critical, and some are chaotic. So the x-axis is real. Furthermore, Gabor has just gotten recent evidence that molecules that bind to receptors um, are maximally efficient if they are partially decoherent, but not totally classical. If that's true, we have to rethink biochemistry. Um, so it looks like it's true, and it's all really interesting. So the Poise realm is almost certainly real, and I won't say more about it than that, except we have patents pending on it and, you know, wish we could make a billion dollars. It could be the start of something as huge as the IT world. It's a whole new aspect of reality, and we're right. Anyway, that gives us answer one to Descartes. Somehow, and I'm going to be a bit more specific, and I hope that you're tracking this, the mind-brain system is quantum, poised realm, and classical, or classical for all practical purposes. Um, by the way, importantly, one way you can get recoherence is not by just recoherence, 
quantum measure and take a decoherent quantum variable and make it coherent again. Uh, and that's absolutely not. And it's a non dissipated quantum measure of the event. And that's standard. It's called the quantum xenon effect. What I've just told you implies that there's new physics in the Boyd's realm because decoherence is a dissipated term. Therefore, the Schrodinger equation does not propagate unitarily uh, and time reversibly. And indeed, there is new physics. It's called the quantum anti xenon effect, where the jump between two quantum states is not exponential with, a, with, with your normal half life, it's something else. So there's new physics sitting in there, okay? And, and we'll just be getting to find out, and it's real, okay? All right. That begins to be the basis for answering Descartes. The mind brain system, and now I'm going to try to tie it to neurons in total speculation in the moment. Somehow is quantum, Poiserell, and classical, and can do it over and over and over again. So mind can keep acting on the brain, a causally, never causally, uh, and keep having consequences for the brain. I think that potentially answers the card. Now, how do we tie it to neurons? I'm going to have to invent something. Then I'm going to have to tell you how I'm going to try to test it. But let me tell you first how I'm going to try to test this idea. No, I haven't got it yet. Um, I'm going to make a jump. No, not good. What time did I start? What time did I start? Yeah. Well, he started at 12, so he, uh, if he has 50 minutes, he should go until 12.50 at least. 50, yeah. 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 So, Yes, uh, 20 minutes. I turn it five. I'm fine. Okay. 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 Um, now let me make a jump. I want to propose, this is a separate idea. I want to ask, what is conscious experience associated with? This is just a pure hypothesis. I'm going to tell you how to test it in a moment. I want to guess that qualia, conscious experience, is somehow associated with quantum measurement. I'll show you later why I like the idea. Um, Penrose may say the same thing, and Henry Staff may say the same thing. Um, anyway, I'm saying. Um, so let's try the idea. Let me tell you how we could test it. I cannot presumably have your experiences, but I worked with fruit flies with soft love for many years. You can anesthetize fruit flies with ether. It is a straightforward genetic experiment to take a population of normal or wild type fruit flies and they're away. And you expose them to a certain concentration and duration of ether. And it's really obvious that they fall asleep, they fall over. I've watched them. Okay. Then if you take the ether away, a few minutes later they wake up and start flying around. So they're anesthetized. So we can clearly anesthetize root flies. But that means we can do a selection experiment, selecting over a sequence of generations for a subpopulation of root flies that take ever shorter durations and lower doses of ether to be anesthetized. And let's suppose we finally have a population of fruit flies that takes no ether to be anesthetized, or only a tiny bit, okay? Call that the mutant population. It's now straightforward using old-fashioned genetics or DNA sequencing to find the genes that have mutated in the selected population. And from that, we can go back and compare the proteins that are encoded for it by the mutated proteins in the normal flies that are not mutated, and we get to ask a new question. I don't know exactly how to do it, but the idea is the following. Do the normal proteins by themselves, or perhaps in certain membranes, carry out some quantum measurement events that mutated proteins do not? That's an askable question. Suppose that we found that the answer was yes. That would be the beginnings of scientific evidence that somehow conscious experience is actually associated with a quantum measurement event. Would we believe it yet? Of course not. 
It's just the start of an experimental program, but it's an experimental program. Therefore, we're talking about science that we can possibly do, even if right now it's very speculative. Let's imagine we've done it, and 20 years from now, we think, yeah, it's really true. Okay, somehow conscious experience is associated with quantum measure. I'll come back to that later. I'm not going to make up a story about neurophysiology and what could conceivably, this is totally speculative, be going on. You all know that in synapses, there's a presynaptic, pre uh, there's a cleft, and there's a presynaptic and a postsynaptic cleft, both pre-cleft and post-cleft side of the synapse. And that what happens is that neurotransmitters are released on the presynaptic side, past, past the cleft, and are then uh, bound by postsynaptic protein receptor complexes. Um, the binding of the neurotransmitter by the proteins on the postsynaptic side alters the behavior of the synapse, which then alters the current, the transmembrane potential of the synapse, which then alters the, the, uh, the membrane potential of the dendrites, which then accumulate and flow to the cell body, the, the, the soma, uh, where they're accumulated and they go above the threshold, you get an action potential which propagates down the neuron. So a possible connection of everything I'm saying to neurobiology is what I just told you. And it suggests something utterly novel, that the business end of the brain isn't the neurons firing, it's the uh, postsynaptic proteins and their quantum absorption or non-absorption behavior in quantum measurement that are essential. All of which is ultimately testable. It's <coughs> on neurobiology a lot. Okay? Okay, so that's that part. Um, I want to tell you next why I like the idea that uh, measurement is associated with, with quality, with conscious experience. Look around the room. You are aware of uh, what's called a unity of consciousness. Okay, you, you have this entire, this isn't in there, I'm just adding it. <laughs> you, you have a unity of consciousness. Um, we got to where we are in computer science and the mind, to say it simply, from Bertrand Russell, who introduced sense data, A flat now, red here, then sense data statements for Stu Kaufman, A flat now is true, to representing the sense data state by the on-off state of a formal neuron with McCulloch and Pitts. I worked with McCulloch at some time. To the idea of formal neurons or logic gates propagating yes-no answers around. But it's two things have happened. We snuck in uh, the sense data in the truth or falsity of the sense data statement. From the sense data statement, we don't have the sense data, we just have the truth or falseness of the Stu Kaufman A flat now. But the other thing that Russell did is he invented sense data, absolutely invented it, because he had done Kipia Mathematica in set theory. <coughs> you don't see sense data when you look around, you see the room and everybody in it. You have a unity of consciousness. If you read Francis Crick's book, The Astonishing Hypothesis, this comes up as what's called the binding problem. Let me tell you the binding problem. I look at a yellow triangle and a red square. Crick says, suppose that yellow and triangle and red and square are processed in four anatomically disconnected areas of the brain. How can we see a red triangle and whatever I said, orange square? In other words, how do we get the right things together? And that's the binding problem. That's a baby part of the unity of consciousness problem. Nobody has a solution for it. They do, but it's stupid. It's a, there's a 40 hertz oscillation, and things in the same phase of the oscillation somehow get bound. But if you think of all the things that can get bound, there are zillions of them, and how you squeeze them into a 40 hertz oscillation in a discriminable way just sounds nuts. So I need to tell you a last thing about quantum mechanics. It's called non-locality. Einstein, Einstein, Rosen, and Podolsky. In 34, it said quantum mechanics is utterly weird. It says that if you have a quantum uh, uh, photon 
the false two photon with low energy states. And they fly apart and they're now a million miles away from two electrons. They go from a higher energy to a lower energy electron. And they fly and they're entangled is the magical word. And they entangled particles are now a million miles apart. And you measure a property of one of them, say is it spin up or spin down. Once you know the answer, it instantaneously implies the answer about the second particle. Um, now, depending how you measure it, it could be spin up, spin down, or spin left, spin right, depending upon the certain Gerlach apparatus and how you set it up. <coughs> so the amazing thing, said Einstein, is this is spooky action at a distance because it violates special relativity where nothing can propagate faster than the speed of light. Well, it's been proven to be true of an aspect of it in the 90s, not, and it's called non-locality. And it's negative. It's a feature of our universe. Entangled particles are non-locally entailed. Space doesn't matter. And I want to use entanglement to solve the unity of consciousness problem. And I'll just mention it. The hypothesis is 300 uh, degree Kelvin photon. Entangled particles are anatomic. Parts of your brain that are anatomically disconnected. Then quantum measurement events take place get correlated to quality of, and that may solve the unity of consciousness problem. And I like that. So that's all I'm going to say about, about that. Okay, now, I want to try to get... How much do you have, Vestal? Um, I can do it in five minutes. Okay. okay. I now want to try to get to some new ideas. Uh, so can we go down? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm going to say, I've, uh, everything that I've told you is in the, in the article that's on that. Um, let me jump to the very end before I give you the free will part. Do we think that if this is right, we can make some sort of system that is, uh, say, a liposome with all of this going on, just to be quite prebiotic and pro you know, protocellular? Can we make a physical system that does all of this, that takes in quantum behavior, Freud's realm stuff, and classical stuff, and does stuff with it, and emits? quantum coherent stuff, and closed realm stuff, and classical stuff. Sure. Is this thing algorithmic? <clears throat> no. Algorithms are Turing machines. Turing machines are finite state, finite time, namely zeros and ones, and now and the next moment, subsets of classical physics. This is not classical physics at all. All of information theory is based on bits. This is something that's entirely different. We don't even know how to define information for what I'm talking about. Yet something's going on, okay? Um, is there potentially machines that we can make? Yeah. So I'm going to call these trans turing systems. And I think there's a potential technological revolution here. And I think the mind brain system might be this. And this is really important because we're all in love with Turing machines and everything we've done with it since Turing. Maybe this is the start of something that's as big or bigger, okay? And I know you just heard what I said, and I know you understand. We're now talking about a system that's quantum, close realm, and classical, going back and forth, interacting with itself and other things. Just call them trans systems and wonder, what can we make out of this? Are we they? Now I want to get, in the last part, to a responsible free will. Here's the problem. Suppose that I'm a Newtonian machine my brain. I'm completely optimistic. <coughs> I walk up to an old man, I pick up a frying pan, and I bash him on the head and I kill him. And the judge pulls me in and says, kill him. And I said, look, I, I don't have any free will at all. I'm a deterministic system. So we've been stuck there for a long time. Now try quantum mechanics. I'm wandering down the street and a quantum event happens, say radioactive decay. And I pick up the frying pan and I kill the little old man. And you, and you say, well, I, I'm missing the fact. Quantum measurement is ontologically indeterminate. I haven't told you that. You square the amplitude of the quantum wave to get the probability that that's the one that will be measured. But you don't know that it will be measured. You know the probability, but not the other. It's ontologically indeterminate, except on the bone interpretation of quantum mechanics, which sort of nobody believes. So quantum mechanics is indeterminate. And quantum measurement, therefore, is also a causal. I forgot to say that. 
Okay. Um, okay. Um, here's the moves I'm going to make. I, better, I, I can do this all in one big paragraph. I realized about three months ago, there's something funny going on that's right in the middle of quantum mechanics that we haven't looked at. So statement one, because a measurement event is ontologically indeterminate, there's no deductive mechanism yet found, and I have an argument that it can't be found, but so does somebody else, that determines the outcome. Therefore, the outcome of quantum measurement, that the spot appears here on the screen, is there's no mechanism, it's a-causal, and it is totally unentailed. There's no entailment for leading to the fact that the spot appears here on the screen, plain one. Plain two is some quantum measurements are dissipative, like the spot that lasts for a year, some aren't. I want to talk about things like the spot on the screen. And it dawned on me, my God, it's stable. It's there for months. Now let's ask, why is the spot stable? I don't know whether it's quantum or classical, but the answer is the spot is full of a bunch of chemical bonds, and chemical bonds are stable because of the Pauli exclusion principle, which says that no two quantum variables in the system can be in the same quantum state. So they have to be in different quantum states, and they're separated by energy variables. And that separation of energy barriers is exactly why molecules and molecular bonds are stable. And that's what Schrodinger realized in this famous book, What is Life? What's the source of the order in biology? That's why it's stable. It's quantum mechanics. The spot is not stable because it's thermodynamically stable. Coal is stable because of quantum mechanics, because you can burn coal. So coal's not of a low energy state. It's stable because of quantum mechanics. Okay, so the spot is stable structure. Quantum, let's call it a quantum stable structure. But as a quantum stable structure, here's the second step. I have to say something first. In quantum mechanics, there's a boundary condition that determines the behavior of the wave equation, typically given by a classical potential, um, that, for example, determines the form of the standing wave that has to fit the boundary condition. If you change the boundary conditions, you change the behavior of the standing wave, just like a guitar string. In quantum mechanics, the boundary conditions play no causal role at all. They enable the possible behaviors of the quantum systems, but they do not cause it. The billiard table does play a causal role, but it doesn't mean it's a flaw. Okay, next step then. The spot, once it exists in the universe, is an enabling boundary condition on the behavior of a new quantum system. To be simple, if there is a spot and photons hit it, they'll bounce off of it in different ways than if there's not a spot. We all agree? This is a little subtle, so hang in with me. The photon hits and there's a spot, but the spot is an unentailed quantum measurement. But once the spot is there, and so you develop the film, the behavior of a new quantum system, photons hitting the spot, will be different than if the spot is not there. Therefore, the spot is a new boundary condition. It's like changing the Stern-Gerlach apparatus by changing its boundary conditions from measuring spin up, spin down, and creating spin up, spin down, to measuring and creating spin left, spin right. You change the boundary conditions, you change the behavior of the electron, you change the boundary conditions, you change the behavior of the next quantum system. Okay, so the spot is a new enabling boundary condition, but it is unentailed. It would you take me four sentences? It is unentailed. No, take it six. It is unentailed. Therefore, the new behaviors of the new quantum system that are possible and made possible by the boundary conditions are also unentailed. Therefore, right in the middle of quantum mechanics with dissipative measurement, you can get a sequence of totally unentailed behaviors that keep propagating. It's a spin up, spin down, it's 50 50, over a sequence of measurements, all unentailed. 
The consequence is going to be a sequence that's random, spin up, spin down, spin up, spin down, spin up, spin down. It's totally random. Doesn't happen. But suppose over the sequence, and this is the critical point, suppose over the sequence of measurements, the boundary conditions keep changing so that the amplitudes and the amplitudes squared by the Born rule change from spin up having a probability of 99% and spin down 1%. And the next time, it's spin up 1%, spin down 99%. And the next time, it's spin up 99%. So it keeps changing. Are you with me? Or 100% and 0%. Yes? Then, at a minimum, the sequence of measurements gives you a non-random, non-stationary series. And it can, in fact, go to the extreme of all, all yes and all no. I think I've just given you potentially the ontological basis for a responsible free will. Okay? The ontological basis. That is to say, for the non-random, non-entailed behavior of the mind-brain system. And one more point. If we do not know the boundary condition because of the chaotic system, we can't even know the unentailed behavior because we can't say what the boundary condition is. They are. Nothing that I have said tells us what experience is. And I'm going to end with a wild statement. Nothing that I've told you tells us what experience is. Um, uh, David Chalmers famously says, no third person fact will tell us what experience, conscious experience is, what the subjective pole of the is. I think he's right. Um, so we're free to say anything we want. Um, Here's a theorem. It's called the strong free will. And it has to do with stern Gerlach apparatus and changing the boundary conditions for spin up, spin down, spin up, spin right. By Conway and Kocha. They say if the physicist has free will in deciding whether to use a stern Gerlach apparatus to measure spin up or spin down, or change the boundary conditions of the stern Gerlach apparatus to measure spin up, spin right, and therefore change the behavior of the quantum then listen to their conclusion. Their theorem is, nothing in the past of the universe determines the behavior of the electron. Therefore, there can be no mechanism for measurement. And then they use the following amazing word. They say, the electron decides to be spin up or spin up consistent with the point of view. They use the experiential term to size. So, I just want to throw out for us the weird possibility that I have no idea how to test, but that Conway and Cochin say too. This must be the basis of our free will, and I want to add, possibly our experience. Maybe experience sitting out there in the universe with Conway and We don't know. And I don't think it's totally nuts. I don't know how to test it. If I could anesthetize an electron, I'd know how to test it, but I don't know how to do that. Thank you all.